Before I welcome on yet another amazing guest to the Live Inspired Podcast, I wanted to extend my most sincere thank you to each and every one of you for listening in your car, on the bus, while you're training for your next 5K, however you're listening. You, my friends, are a critically important and valued member of our Live Inspired community. If you ever want to get in touch with me, I'm always available on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And you can always send me an email anytime at your convenience to podcast at johnolearyinspires.com. Again, that email, podcast at johnolearyinspires.com. So let's dive into today's episode. You are going to love it. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Man, I'm just going to get right into today's episode because you're going to be blown away by it. You're going to be loving it. You're going to be inspired by it. You're going to laugh. You might cry. I'm encouraging you right now to buckle up because this woman has one of the most remarkable stories of resilience, of overcoming, of courage, of service, of love that I've heard. Her name is Evie Pomporis. She's a multi-platform journalist and host who frequently appears on NBC, MSNBC, CNN, and ABC. She covers a wide range of topics such as national security, law enforcement, personal protection, situational awareness, and how to live life fearlessly. Evie is a former New York City Police Department cadet She served in the Secret Service as a special agent. She provided protective details. Just get your pens ready. You'll need to take notes for President Barack Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, as well as former presidents George W. Bush, William J. Clinton, George H. Bush, among many others. She has worked complex criminal investigations. She has also gone undercover in operations. Evie, as if the resume isn't already long enough, is also an interrogator for the agency's elite polygraph unit and trained by the Department of Defense in the art and in the science of lie detection, human behavior, and cognitive influence. As if this is not enough, my friends, on September 11th, Evie finds herself at ground zero and has an incredible story around service, around survival, around loss, around lessons learned. It's dramatic, it's emotional, it's intense. She's gonna share all of this and much more with you today on the Live Inspired Podcast. You know, I look forward to every one of our guests, but I'm really excited about this one today. Maybe for one more reason, because she chose wisely. She married a guy right here in my own backyard from St. Louis, Missouri. So she's got great choices in geography, great choices in guys, great choices in impact in life. You're going to love her. Her name is Evie Pampora. She's with us on the Live Inspired podcast. So my friends, without further ado, Evie, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hi, John. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, I I hope after that long brag sheet that your head still fits in whatever room you're in right now, but it it is deserved. And one thing that you you don't talk about, you don't hear about as part of the bio is your background, your early days. And I think a cool part of your story, Evie, is your heritage. You know, everybody's got a story. It's, It's usually not the one we're telling the world, though. And you've got this remarkable story of parents coming over from another country, immigrating, and living into the American dream. Would, would you begin your journey today by talking a little bit about mom and dad? Yeah, sure. My Both my parents are Greek, and they came from Greece to the U.S. At the time they left Greece, um, things were very bad. Actually, both my parents grew up in villages, and they were, they were very poor. There's pictures of my mom, actually, with, like, she had no shoes for, you know, one pair for years, and then she had a pair of shoes for a couple of years, and her clothes were rags. I mean, it's really, you know, wild to see these pictures of them, how they grew up. And 
they come to the U.S. Like, honestly, like how many people come to the U.S. for the same reason to just um, live and, and, and try to work and, and take care of themselves. So when they came to the U.S., I think it was in the mid-70s. And I mean, they probably, my dad probably did every job you could think of. In fact, actually his first job, when my father came to the United States, they settled in Washington Heights, it's right by Harlem. And it was a pretty rough area at the time. And when he came to the U.S., he couldn't get a job. Mm. He, uh, he spoke with a thick accent. He did go to night school to try to learn English. But he went around and every place was like, no, we're not interested. No, we're not interested. And then finally, he was so desperate. He went to this one coffee shop up in uh, Harlem. And he walked in and he asked the man, he's like, can you please give me a job? And the man's like, no, I'm, I'm not interested. And my father's like, please, you know, I'll do anything. I'll sweep. I'll take out your trash. And the man was like, you know, no, no, thank you. Don't need anything. And he's trying to walk and kind of push my dad out the door. My father finally looked at him and he's just like, please. He's like, I will work for free. Hmm. He's like, I will work for free. He's like, I will do whatever you need me to do. He's like, just try me out. Try me out. And if I'm not good, I will leave. It won't cost you anything. You know, maybe you can give me some donuts or, or, you know, to take home to my family. And the man turned around. He walked away. And my father kind of just stood there defeated. And the guy came back with a mop and, you know, a bucket. He's like, start mopping. He actually worked. I think it was about a couple of weeks. He worked for free. Mm. And then eventually the man did give him a job. But it was difficult for him um, and for my mom too. She started sewing and then eventually she learned to, she started cutting hair, but I watched them go through these things. It was always hard sometimes too, because I, and then I was born here and I, I learned Greek first. My first language was Greek and then I had, I learned English in school. And so it was hard watching my parents try to navigate this world. Like we lived in low income housing in New York and we eventually moved to Queens and or some people that don't know, it's just a subsidized housing when you can't afford regular housing. Mm -hmm. And we weren't poor, but we weren't great either. I lived in a very high crime area, lots of drugs. You know, I remember somebody was killed in the apartment above us. And it was a little bit like the Wild West growing up in New York City during that time period, the 80s and 90s. And that's the time period I really grew up. So we grew up in in fear in some ways. Be mm. careful. Watch where you're going. Don't go here. Don't go there. Don't talk to this person. We didn't play outside. There was no such thing as playing outside. I had nowhere to play outside. My brother or I, the only thing we would do every once in a while is in the summertime, the fire department would come, the FDNY, and open up the fire hydrants on the street. <laughs> and it was like the highlight of our <laughs> summer. We'd go out and run through the fire hydrant. And that was the extent of it. So when you grow up and the highlight of the summer is when the fire department comes by and, and turns on the sprinklers <laughs> and your dad is sweeping for free and your mother's learning how to sew and they're learning English and English is your second language as a young one. But you're comparing yourself to your brother's experience and to your neighbor's experience and to the guy, the apartment over. It's kind of the world you know. And so you're not comparing yourself to somebody out in St. Louis or LA or uh, anywhere else. It's It's your neighborhood, I would imagine, is your the bar. Yeah. So d did you know that this was uh, challenging? No, I didn't. I was like, I, this is just how it is. I didn't think anything neg negative about it. I was like, this is just how it is. It's when you get older. Yeah. I think it's when you get older, when you go into the teenage years, the latter years, and then you're exposed to other people, to other kids, the different, you know, kids who come from other neighborhoods where you start doing that comparison. But I think when we're younger, we just know what's in, in the immediate proximity uh, around us. And even my parents, as, as much as they struggled financially, they, they didn't want to put my brother and I in public school. They put us in a, a private, it was a Greek school, actually, mm. um, because they were so afraid to put us in a public school because we just lived in like very high crime areas. And so we were just kind of exposed to very similar things. But later on, it's when you see somebody like, oh, why do they get to drive a nice car? Mm. Or why don't I get to go here? Or why don't I get to have these nice things? Why do I have to shop at, you know, this thrift store or this really, you know, this other store where the clothes are not as nice? And I think that's when it starts happening to us, where we start questioning. My pediatrician growing up, his name is R.G. Safutis. The, the word Safutis begins with a T. 
My ah, the guy who lived one great. door down from me at St. Louis University, where I went to college, is Pontelis Moises, a Greek. Both these guys were first generation Greeks, incredibly proud of their heritage. Did mom and dad teach you, although uh, life might be hard and different and full of some anxiety, that they you ought to be proud from where you came? Yeah, they did. My parents love the United States. They're for them, they're like America gave them so many things. And they were very clear to, to make sure that I understood that. But at the same time, they're like, this is where you come from. These are your ancestors, you know, your ancestors. I learned about Greek mythology yeah. and history, but all my family too, though, even to today, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, they're in Greece. So what they would do every year is they would save money. My parents couldn't afford a babysitter in the summer. So as soon as school was out in New York, my brother and I would be on a plane straight to Greece mm. and we would stay with our grandparents. It was cheaper for them to have us fly to Greece <laughs> and to live with our grandparents. And we would go, John, we'd go to the village. We'd live in the village from, in New York, schools close like around June, so June, July, August. And then we'd come back in September for school. I mean, my grandma had an outhouse. Like there was no bathroom. <laughs> it was an outhouse. We had this big plastic tub that we put in the backyard and fill it up with boil it with hot water. And so we had really contrasting lives from here to there. But every summer we'd live there. And so we we understood that that was also part of us and part of who we were and part of where we came from. Did that background keep you from becoming entitled as you grew and expanded? We're going to get into your career in a moment at some of the places you've been and some of the successes you've enjoyed. But I'm curious, Evie, did growing up walking out to the outhouse for three months and coming back in, has that shaped the way you've grown into a lady in life? I do appreciate things. And humility is a really big thing. I I actually probably maybe even developed it more so. I I think when we're young, sometimes we're a little bit kind of, I don't want to say aloof, John, but we're like in our own world and we're really kind of focused on us and we don't understand everything. I think humility for me, like I always had it. My parents always taught me to be humble and to listen and not to be grateful. But I think it was really later in life where I really got it. Mm. Let's speed the tape just a little bit because there's so much to share and I want to make sure we get some of the big stories in. You're a, a beautiful young lady. You're working the career in New York and then all of a sudden you get this idea to completely shift careers. I want you to tell the story about how you became desirous of joining the New York City Police Academy. Well, I went to college like everybody else. I was trying to figure out my way and you know, I did grow up in a very kind of like fearful environment kind of very, kind of don't do this, kind of closed off from everything. And it was very frustrating for me. It's like, you can't do this. You can't do that. You're, and a lot of it was, you're a girl. Girls don't do these right. things. Girls don't go out. Girls don't this. And the more I heard it, the more I heard, no, you shouldn't do this, the wilder I got, the more I kind of felt, you know, like, hey, just stop locking me. And after college, I remember I was on the subway um, working in an insurance company. I had no idea what I was doing. It was just a job. I had this degree. I felt like I need to, to do something that I, I want to help people. I want to be part of something. It was a moment where I just saw this police officer. Some way doors open. I see this police officer and I was just like, huh, <laughs> I can do that. I didn't realize it till later that over the years, I was kind of headed into that direction because of the way we were raised to be afraid. And even like we were victims of crime constantly because of where we lived and we were so susceptible to so many things. And police didn't really pay attention to us because like, I hate to say it, but like the people that live in neighborhoods where there is crime, where they're poor or they're not as desirable. Like I had hit a point, I'm like, I'm tired of being at the mercy of everybody else. I want to take care of myself. I want to protect myself. I want to protect my family. And that's kind of how I went into the PD. Complete curveball. When you told your family that this petite statured lady is, uh, yeah, I'm going to go out for uh, the New York City Police Academy. What was the response from them? Not good. (laughs) They were so upset, John. They were upset. They did not understand. I remember my mother cried. And I'm thinking, I'm like, did she hear me right? I said, I'm going to be a police officer. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, mom, I'm not going to go deal drugs. Did you hear me correctly? <laughs> like, I think you maybe heard the wrong profession. She what, didn't understand. What, My was, dad didn't understand. 
in fact, when I was when I was filling in the paper with John, like I had to ask my parents their information because they do background checks on you, and like their paperwork for when they became citizens and all those things. And my father was like, he handed it to me very reluctantly, and he's like, "Why are you doing that? They're never going to hire you. They don't want someone like you." Mm. And I heard that, and it, it stabbed me like deep and. You know, look, it's my dad, and I I didn't say anything. And inside me, I'm like, I will show you. Not in a mean way, but I was like, I will show you. And I was just like, let me, well, I'm going to try, and I don't care. I've learned that that we always have to listen to ourselves. Because if I listened to other people, even my parents, I wouldn't have done the things I did. You had a sergeant named Corrigan. I'm going to share a quote that I think I got right, but with with all of the controversies sometimes that our police department faces, I think this quote is so relevant, not only to the police department, but to all of those who are in a place of protection. So here it is. Uh, He's speaking to the entire class and he says, listen, if you go through your entire career and you never once use your weapon, you've had an awesome, productive career because this, and he points to his mouth is far more powerful than this. And he points to his gun. Unpack that quote for us. He was my um, police science instructor, Corrigan. What he spent the majority of class instruction was to teach us to get people to comply without the use of force. This really transcends into other areas of our lives because we think we should make people do what we want. How do I make this person do this? How do I make my significant other do that? How do I make this person listen to me? You can't make anybody do anything. You might be able to do it in that moment, Mm. but long term, that person will resent you. It's going to blow up in your face. You're not really learning how to communicate properly with people. And his mindset, what they were teaching us is like, don't go to force to try to make people to do things you want them to do. Learn how to use your mouth. Learn how to use your words. Learn how to communicate with people because this is how you're going to get people to listen to you. And that was the first time I heard that because when you watch TV, what do you watch? You watch these (laughs) movies, cops are shooting everybody, you watch the news. You know, I keep throwing data out there because I'm an adjunct professor too. I teach criminal justice and criminology, but majority of police don't ever use their weapon in their career. It's not the norm. It's not the norm to use your weapon. Most will will go through a 25-year career and never have Mm -hmm. used it. I mean, the first time you used it, you were in the academy. It's the first time you ever held a gun. What was that experience like for you, the, the very first time you are handed a live weapon? I was at the range. We were all lined up, and we, we had practice, so they have you practice with it. You know, you, you shoot it dry. There's nothing in it. You learn how to handle it, how to use it, how to point it, all those things. And then eventually, once they think you're comfortable and you've learned that, then they will let you shoot live. And so the first time there was actually live ammo and I was lined up at the range. I do remember this moment so clearly. The instructor calls it and the bell goes off. And so you're supposed to shoot. And I hear everybody going off around me. And I just stood there and I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> what's going to happen when I pull this? And I pull it and the round goes out and the, the gun kind of, you know, jerked all quite a bit. And I realized, wow, this thing's pretty powerful. I better, I better like lock this in. And I just didn't know what to expect. I didn't know the power weapon, you know, it had. And I grew up, I grew up in a city where guns aren't really popular, you know, where I grew up mm-hmm. is in different parts of the country. So I never, I never grew up in an environment where I had ever used uh, a, a weapon before. But they taught me to respect it. Like you have to respect it, to be careful the way you manage it, to be thoughtful. Like they really grilled it into to us like this weapon is something you must respect because of the power it has and how you handle it and how you secure it. What do you think um, the most important thing you learned from the New York City Police Academy was? Run. You better start running. Running. Physical fitness. Oh my gosh. I went in there and I'm thinking, I got this. I've seen <laughs> cops. I can do this. And <laughs> no, I learned how to work out the right way. I was like, I didn't know anything about working out. I thought I did. Physical fitness, the ability to physically protect yourself matters. That you have to, like, how you think you are, like, you fantasize how strong you actually think you are, and then you go to a place like this, it's like, why don't we just show you the reality of how strong you really are? And then you realize, man, oh my gosh, 
I am not. I have work to do. And so it, they really, they make you look at yourself. You see the truth. And then you see what you need to do to wow. fix that. And I know you're big into self-awareness. You, you grow as a cadet. When did you realize the call-in was even higher than that in some regards, that you wanted to go into Secret Service? I had applied to the U.S. Secret Service while I was going through the police academy training. And again, it was kind of a, it, I don't want to say a fluke thing, but I had put out resumes to different agencies. And I was like, let me see what happens. And when I was called to go, I was offered a position. It's a conditional offer of employment, which means you don't have the job. You go to training, and then if you make training, then you have the job. And I, I almost didn't go. I At this point, when I first went into the NYPD, I did not like it. I didn't know what I was doing. I was struggling. But that, by this point, I got it. I loved my, my classmates, my company. It was good. I went and talked with one of the, the lieutenants, and he said, I told him, sir, I don't know what to do. And I thought he would tell me to stay. Mm. Like, where are you going to go? Stay here. And he told me, he said, go. Go. He said, go you have an opportunity. You're like, if you don't like it, just come back. We'll take you. And I did it. It was scary. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I also felt prepared because I was already in the NYPD. How, how similar and how different was that early training with Secret Service over the academy? They're different. They're different because I went from a class of 1,500 and then you go to a class of 54. So 1,554. But then also the service, like your hands pick. With the NYPD, you take a test, you go through a certain process. So they kind of hire you in mass numbers. But the hiring process for the U.S. Secret Service is bar none. I actually think it's probably the hardest hiring process there is out there. You go through so many different testing, evaluation, polygraphs, all these different things, background checks, and they really select you. Like they're investing in you. They're saying, we think you as a person are investing in. Mm. Whereas in the P- police departments, NYPD, which is 1,500, they're not really looking at you that closely. And then here, when you go, you're standing next to someone who's a former Navy SEAL, a former Army Ranger, a former professional football player who's now not playing football and wants to do this job. And you're really around the elite of the elite. So I'm standing there looking around. I'm like, this is a pretty good place to be. <laughs> it's not so bad. I'm doing okay. Early in your training, though, you have a conversation. One of the guys, and he does this not to belittle you, but I, I, I know uh, I know how sometimes words burn. Early in your training, he puts his arm around you and says, listen, uh, there are some guys here who don't think you belong. When, when you heard those words, how'd you feel? And what, what do you do with those? We get judged by what we look like, why people you know, make a snapshot assessment of what they think we are based on our appearance or our size or our gender or race, whatever. And that happened to me. Initially, I was actually surprised because I thought because I felt like I was at such an elevated place. But it really goes to show you that it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's really how some people think. It bothered me. But at the same time, I'm like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I earned this like you. And, but I also was like, I don't want anyone to have that perception of me. And I trained and trained and trained John to the point so that I could be on the level of the guy. Mm. I was like, I will do what they do. I will run at their pace. I will do what they do. And it required more physical training on my end because just the, bio- the biology of it is men's bodies are different than women's bodies. They, they just are. <laughs> and the power that they need to do a push-up or a pull-up is different than the power I need to exert to do the same thing. But I just trained. Morning, noon, night, whenever I had free time, I always trained. And in addition to the training that we did there. And I was just like, it was also that part of me is like, I don't want to hear anything from anybody. And at the same time, though, you also want to belong. Mm. Because with these organizations, if you're not wanted or if they see you as a weak link, it's very bad because there needs to be almost like this agreement that everybody deserves to be there. And if there isn't, it can be a problem because then nobody wants to go out in the field with you. Nobody wants to do a search warrant with you. People look at you as a liability. That is dangerous. And so I really was like, I'm going to earn this. Well, you earned it, but I'm going to share a quote that I've heard you use before and unpack for our our audience what it means. So here's your quote. How you define yourself is your choice. How others define you is their choice. It's up to you to decide which definition you prefer. Yeah, I believe that. In that moment, it's like, that's what they thought of me. That was their definition. It doesn't mean it needs to be mine. Sometimes it does matter what people say. I feel like there are moments in life where we have to decipher which opinions matter which don't. 
that's the tricky part. Mm. When should I listen to other people and when should I tune them out? How do you do that personally? How do you decide when a guy is judging you for your looks? It doesn't matter. But a a commanding officer or peer who's judging you on a different front, like, oh, these are words I need to hear. How do you make that decision personally? I take the emotional part out of it. I try not to make it about me personally. And I stop and I think to myself, is there any truth to what they're saying? With this specific situation where people thought I shouldn't be there, I had found out after the fact that the physical criteria for men and women are different. And it's also like that I also found out for the military and for most police departments, men have different criteria to meet and women have different criteria to meet. And so looking at it from that objective, I said, okay, I can see that. And so that's when I said, well, I'm going to train at the men's level. Now, if at that point, if I'm meaning now everything that they're meaning and that person still has an issue, ah, now it's not me. Now it's you. Mm-hmm. So it's the ability to not get defensive. I think that's the biggest thing. When you hear critique or criticism or whatever you hear from somebody, don't get defensive. Don't take it as a personal slight. Pause. Step back and say, is there any truth to what they're saying? And is there an opportunity here for me? to grow from this, to be better from this? Or is this coming from an opinion too of somebody who's a complete mess themselves? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we also have to look at like what other people's lives are. Like That's who right. are you listening to? What have they done in their lives? How do they make the world better? How do they contribute? It's also who is the giver of the information mm-hmm. as well. The daughter of two Greek immigrants who grew up in Queens goes on to join the police academy, then secret service, then you get a, an opportunity to apply, at least, to become an interrogator. Yeah, I didn't want to do it. I didn't think I'd be any good. I, we have a polygraph unit in the U.S. Secret Service. It's a very small elite unit. And these were the who's who's of getting information out of people. And I had already done interviews as a case agent. I worked cases on my own. Secret Service is a dual mission agency, which means we not just only did protection, but we actually worked investigations. And so I had interviewed people before, but there's a burden that comes with that or a responsibility. They come to you because you're the final it. It's like Mm. after you, we got nowhere else to go. And so there's so much writing. Sometimes you have a victim of maybe a little girl who was sexually abused. It's like, Hey, we think this person did it to her help us out. And if you can't figure out how to get a confession or how to get to the truth, and it's really about getting to the truth because sometimes I'd have individuals who are suspected of committing a crime and they didn't do it. They were looking at the wrong person. So the goal was to become an objective seeker of the truth. Mm. But there's so much- Gosh, I I hope you start teaching that to society. Can you imagine if we all Democrats and Republicans and believers and non-believers came together and were objectively seeking truth? That's a cool thing to seek in life. If we we each have a narrative, you can make something work to fit your narrative. Yeah. And so if we look at even now, like a lot of things are coming up with false confessions. And everyone's like, how did they get a false confession? Why would this person give a false confession? How did they get someone who never did it say that they did something? And people are now being exonerated through DNA and all that because you can push people, even sway them or wear them out. Some people, it could be age, it could be a mental issue, it could be emotional issue, but you can get people to sometimes admit to doing something that they didn't do. And when you go into that room as a law enforcement, I'm like, that's my guy. Mm. He did this crime. He committed this robbery. He raped that person. He stole that money. If I go in there with that narrative, I can make anything he says to me fit the narrative I want. And then the things that don't fit, I just push them to the side. No, 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 that doesn't work for me. I'm going to push it to the side. And that's why being seekers of the truth allow us to see both sides. You bring up the whole Democrat Republican thing and what's happening in our country and how we all want to hear things that work for us. And it's so vital that there is no right or wrong, I learned when I did interrogation. When I say right or wrong, it's not black and white. Like people would say, wow, you must talk to some evil people. Mm. In all my years, I never met somebody who was absolutely bad, 100%. Like everybody had elements to them, good and bad. And I never met somebody who was absolutely good and never did anything bad. I also did the opposite. I would polygraph applicants who wanted a job. And these were people who had great resumes, had done extraordinary things. And in that room, I'd say, I want to hear all the bad things you did. Mm. And they, they did bad things. And I learned that the world is gray. 
<laughs> it made me less judgmental of people. Where sometimes we categorize people, this guy, this person bad, that guy good. And, and then we're not like that. And it, it checked me. And I use that now every day with people to not judge others. So most of us won't sit behind a polygraph machine on either side, hopefully, of that polygraph machine. You are an expert on it now, interrogating and understanding what, what you're really witnessing. Help the rest of us understand how we can better observe and seek truth, whether it's in a relationship with a spouse, a partner, a child, facts in the headlines. Like, how do we sit back and actively observe and seek truth? Shut up. That's it. Stop talking and listen. It's called active listening, and we don't do it. We think we do it, but we're more busy talking and not listening. And we're not absorbing in the right questions, the, the right information, and then we're not curious. Mm. When we went through interviewing school, the number one thing they said that will make you better at this is to is don't talk. <laughs> Learn when to shut up in the room. Let people tell you their story. Don't interrupt them. Let them speak. 80% of the time they speak, 20% of the time you speak. Mm. we have this false narrative in our head that we think the more I speak, the more in control I am. I own this conversation. I'm going to steer this person where I want. I'm in charge. You know what? You're not. Because that person has learned everything about you and you've learned nothing about them. There is power in not talking. There is power in listening and observing. That is where we fall short. And that has helped me, not just in law enforcement, interviewing, interrogating people in everything I do now. Everything. Mm. Listen to people. Don't wait for your turn just to talk. Really listen. And even if you don't agree with it, just listen. So speaking of listening and shutting up and not talking and being present and really taking inventory of what's happening around you, I think there are all dates in our lives that profoundly change everything that happens afterwards. And it changed us in such a way that we remember minutiae of that date itself. And for me, one of the dates is January 17, 1987, when at age nine in St. Louis, that's the hometown, by the way, of, of your husband, St. Louis, Missouri, I was involved in a gasoline explosion. And I can tell you the color of sweatpants that I was wearing, the sweatshirt that I had on, where I was in the garage, what happened next, when I came to, where I ran next, who I saw first, the color of the, the wall. I mean, every detail from that morning, I got it. Uh, and it will never slip. And I'm actually grateful for those memories of, of being on fire and remembering that fire and remembering it being put out. So all of that to set up this. September 11th, 2001 is another anniversary that we all remember. We know where we were. Tell us where you were on September 11th. I was, we, our office was in the World Trade Center. I worked at a seven World Trade Center. And I think my moment, uh, as you had your moment, was when the towers were hit. And then the towers collapsed. I was there. I was working in the office. We, you know, when we heard the first plane, and I didn't know it was a plane. My colleagues didn't know it was a plane. We just knew there was a fire and explosion. And while they were evacuating our building, my colleagues and I, it, it wasn't even a thought. I was like, we're going in. And it was a small group of us. And we went in. And as we're trying to get to people and help people, we, we got caught up and the, the attack ourselves. But another plane came, the debris shooting around us. It's, kill, it's like killing everybody around us. And then the tower comes down. And I had been caught at the collapse of the first tower because I was trying to help. We were, at one point, we were getting people coming out and we were either putting them in buses, meaning like ambulances, getting them to get help. Or we either were, you know, they were in shock and we're like, just walk this way. We're trying to steer them, steer them away from the towers walk towards the water. It was just the easiest thing because when people are in shock, they're not able to process a lot. We're like, just go that way, walk in that direction. And, you know, I had my moment where I was caught in the collapse of the first tower. And I was really, I was by the West Side Highway, which is right next to the tower. And that was the moment where I was like, I'm, oh, I'm going to die. And I ended up being alone in the moment of the collapse of that tower. And I remember as it was happening and the tower was falling down around me, I was like, Talking to myself, like thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm actually really good. This is happening. I was like, I don't have a choice. It's not my choice. I can't make the tower not collapse, but I can choose how I will die. Mm. And I was like, and I will not die afraid. And even though I was alone in that moment and I was sad, I remember being sad. I'm like, 
I'm alone. I'm dying. I'm, I'm alone. There's no one like no hand to hold, no one to say goodbye to. I think that hit me hard. And I began to pray. And, you know, I prayed and I said, you know, God, don't let me die alone. Please be where, here with me. And I made peace with it. I made peace in that moment. This is just my end and this is how it is. But I'm not going to be afraid when it happens. And I remember just sitting there being like, okay, I'm going to keep my eyes open. I want to know what's going on around me. And whatever comes, comes. With you and what you've been through, like these things happen to us. I get it. But then we, we choose where we go with it. So you, I didn't have a choice of being caught in the collapse and seeing all these people die. And, and, and having experienced this, this, this horrible event, and you didn't have a choice in that. But we each had a choice of how we would face it. Mm. That's where the choice is. I can face it this way or I can face it this way. And you can either, pain is inevitable in life. It's inevitable, but it's how you take your pain and turn it into light. Evie, why, why was it important for you in the basement of this building that is collapsing all around you and upon you to not have fear? Why, why, why was that almost central to how you were going to die? You were going to die, but you were going to die without fear. Why was that important to you? Yeah, that's a, why does it matter, right? If I'm dying, why does right. it matter if you're dying afraid? Like, what does it matter? It mattered to me because it was the one thing that I could control. It was me. And I think when there's chaos around us, and there was chaos around me everywhere. It was an apocalypse. It was it was out of a movie. Mm. When there's chaos around us, I was like, I can't control all of this, but I can control me. And allowed me also to think clearly, to process information. And even in that moment, as the tower was coming, like when I understood that something's happening, because initially I didn't know John, the tower was going to collapse. Like most people didn't. I just thought I heard sound and bending steel. And I thought a portion of the building might be breaking off because there was chunks of debris falling down from the tower constantly from both towers. I thought it was something like that. And even in that moment, I was just like, I have to think. I can't fall apart here. And so I remember I got water. We had some water there that we were using to wipe people and clean people's wounds. And I was like, I need water. If I get buried alive, I need to have water. I need shelter. And I was able to find like these really large metal tables that people would eat at outside in that area. Mm -hmm. There's these patios. And I was like, that's going to shield me. So fear is okay. But when we let fear turn into panic, it paralyzes us. And then, then we can't function. And then we feel this complete sense, this loss of control. And you always have control. There is only some level of control that you do have. It may not be the control you want to have for the specific thing. I can't control, like I said, the tower. You couldn't control what happened with you at the fire. Like that was out of our hands. But there are other things that I can't control. And when we do that, then we feel more powerful. And when we feel more powerful, we can make better decisions. Because even after the tower collapsed, I stayed to help other people. And even after that, mm. I said, no, I'm going to go back. And I spent the next, I think it was maybe two weeks, part of the search effort, part of like the, the cleanup effort, part of helping out. I mean, finding people's, identifying parts of people and, you know, gathering that information, helping, I, I just whatever I could to help. Because if I had been afraid, I wouldn't have been able to go back there. You went into those buildings with your brothers and sisters with the Secret Service. Did any of your brothers and sisters that day lose their life? Yeah. I lost one colleague, Craig Miller, and he passed. He got caught in the collapse. His remains were found some time later. And I had um. A friend, actually, who she worked worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, Joanna, and she was up on the top floors. And we believe that when the first plane hit, she she probably died instantaneously. Um, and there's just so many people that passed. And I think also, like, you know, I didn't pass. And you have a moment. You're like, well, why did these people not make right, it? And I mean, right. and I well, I did. And it's now, what do I do with that? And, you know, what do I do with my life after that? I can't sit there. I don't want to sit there and be like, well, with me. It's like, well, for me too, it helped me to volunteer afterward and help. You know, I, I it helped me heal and not be afraid. I mean, um, it was three weeks later, I was on a plane flying somewhere else for a protection assignment. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to live in fear. I, I can't. And I 
you know, I, I do that with everything. And I think when we help other people or we find, we find meaning in tragedy, that helps us heal. Mm. Even recently, John, my dad just passed away from pancreatic cancer. And watching him go through that process and then passing, you know, you have this, this person that you love and you, you can't save them. There's nothing you can do. And I didn't have a choice in that. Like, he was going to pass. But I could choose to, to decide how to be as he passed, like how his, his, his end would be. But then even after that, I remember being in hospice. It was a point we couldn't take care of him at home anymore, going to hospice. And saying to them, do you have any volunteer programs? I want to help with other yes. people, you know, when they're going through that. And I always try to find meaning in tragedy. And, and it's not, you know, I don't want to say it's because I'm altruistic. I, I want to help other people. To be selfish, it helps me. <laughs> My pediatrician growing up, again, Dr. Safutis, who is alive and well and amazing in his early 90s, one time in one of my visits with my mom, he was talking about his daughter, and, and he said to my mom, because uh, the daughter wanted to go into one career, and Dr. Safutis wanted her to go into another, and he said to my mom, who is she to tell me what she wants to do for a living? And he, he was serious. <laughs> who is she? You know, and uh, he, he was astounded that his daughter had her own desires and will in life. Did, talk about your dad's transformation from a guy who had no desire at all for his baby girl to join the police academy to a doting father. He, you know, he didn't understand it. And I think because of the way they were raised, they didn't have opportunities like that. They did jobs to survive. And it's sometimes like if you reach for these other things that are just odd and don't make sense, they can't grasp them. But also, I think it's a cultural thing. Um, and I don't think it's just Greek culture. There's a lot of cultures where the parents really push upon their kid, you should do this with your life. I think it's important to help guide children and, and guide others to, to find their path, but we can't get into this place where we're forcing onto somebody else what we think they should do. And at the end of the day, it's like, it's, they have to be good with what they want to do. It took a while, but it's interesting. I went to the NYPD. He didn't like the whole thing. And then even when I went to the Secret Service, he didn't understand what it was. Because it was just so far beyond what they they knew, the world they knew. And even when I went through the Secret Service and I graduated, and I told them, come down to my graduation, then they were like, oh, you're carrying a gun? <laughs> you're <laughs> you're going to arrest people? And they're like, well, it's not really dangerous because eventually when I did get the job, we would dress in civilian clothing, meaning we didn't have a uniform. And so even when I leave the house, because I was young when I got in and I did live at home at the time still, my mom and my dad would see me leaving and they'd think, oh, she's going to the office. You know, she's in a suit. She's not, she's not in danger. So I do think that there was a part of it that they never fully grasped. And that's okay for me. I just <laughs> left it because it was easier. And even when I went to the White House, to the president's detail, President Obama, I would call them up and like, come to the White House. Everybody and the, everybody and their mother would hit me up for a White House tour, <laughs> except my family. And I'm like, come down. You guys want a tour? Come down. And my dad's like, no, no, I'm not going to come. He's like, I don't need to come. He's like, but do me a favor. When you see Obama, you tell him that I said. <laughs> and it was there. <laughs> I mean, wasn't, wasn't dad blown away that this man who came with no pennies in his pocket from Greece raised a daughter in Queens and she is now guarding the president of the United States? Didn't that blow him away? After what it did. I, I still think he didn't realize it. And then what happened is once the prime minister of Greece came to the White House <laughs> and when they came to – all right, here you go, right? That's all you have to hear. Now it's official. The prime minister of Greece comes to the White House. And when he comes, he visits with President Obama. But when he came, I was assigned to protect the Prime Minister of Greece. So um, the U.S. Secret Service, just to inform your listeners, we don't just protect the president. We protect, we protect foreign heads of state that come to the U.S. And they do this because they don't want anybody getting assassinated right. on U.S. soil. So we assume that protection. We work with the team. So Greece comes. I speak Greek. I'm fluent. They assign me to the Prime Minister of Greece. And as, as he's having his meetings, the Greek media, somebody takes a snapshot of me and realizes I happen to be Greek. Oh, my God, she's Greek. This is amazing. And so that got some media attention in Greece, not here. 
And then at that point, my father's like, oh, wow, you're really, you're really <laughs> with these people. Like, it's on the Greek news, so it must be true. And I think at that point, it took time. And even when, as you know, John, like I wrote a book, I have my book that's coming out in soon. I'm thankful for this. Even as my dad was dying, he got the book and I was like, hey, dad, you know, I was like, hey, Baba, Baba's how I would refer to him, Baba, here's my book. And he was so sick and he was on the morphine. And I remember him having the book in front of him at the kitchen table. And he couldn't even read at this point. But he kept touching the cover mm. and like touching it and like almost like caressing the cover. And my brother was there and he looked over to my brother and he's like, look, she wrote a book. Mm. And he never said anything to me about that before. I hadn't mentioned it to him and I was thankful that he got to see it because I think we want, we want them to be proud of us and to feel like we did good so that they feel that they did good. Mm. And that, I think that was the proudest moment or the moment where I'm like, I did okay. He's proud. You did better okay. The book is called Becoming Bulletproof. Protect yourself. Read people. Influence situations. Live fearlessly. That, that last piece in particular, when you read those words, you wrote those words, and you teach us how to live those words, talk to me about what living fearlessly means for you. So what I want to say first is that there's no such thing as being fearless because I, I see a lot of kind of that word being thrown around and we use it. I want to be fearless. I don't want to be afraid of anything. I am afraid. All the great men and women that I worked with in law enforcement, and I've worked with different agencies, military groups, there is nobody void of fear. And so it's live fearlessly, meaning like we don't want to be paralyzed by fear. We don't want to not make decisions in life because we're afraid of illogical fear, but also but to understand it, to know that it's okay to be afraid, that when you are afraid, that there is nothing wrong with you. Right. And I think we live in the world where it's like, why are you afraid? What's wrong with you? And it's like, no, it's normal. You know, I see depression and I see people having these issues and it's like, there's nothing wrong with you. You can't be on fire, happy, you know, on top of the world 24 hours a day. It just isn't possible. You're not unafraid all the time. Every day there's something I'm concerned about or afraid about, but it's about not letting it dictate the direction of our lives when it's illogical and irrational. It's about knowing when it makes sense and then understanding that when there is fear and how it can inhibit us. And even the choices I would make Look, anytime I did a search warrant or arrest warrant mm. and we would go into somebody's home or business or wh whatever we were looking to do, every time I put on my bulletproof vest, I was like, I could die today. Because even with the vest, I was so afraid because the vest only covers a portion of my, it just covers the upper body. My head's exposed, my arms are exposed, my legs are exposed. I'm still vulnerable. And you have to be okay with that. There's nothing wrong with it. And that's power. There is power there. Evie, you've been at central points in American history. It's, a, it's an amazing story, and in particular, when you think of where you've come from. And you've also done this in a wildly male-dominated profession. So one of my final questions for you is, what advice would you give to a young listener right now listening in, whether she or he is tuning in and the walls seem too high and the challenges seem too difficult what, what advice would you give to a young person right now thinking that the goal that they have, the dream that they have for themselves is, is just not attainable? Even if you think it's not attainable, do it anyway. Don't sit and try to think. You look at the whole picture. If I sat there and said, wow, Secret Service training, it's a year for me to get hired. And then I have to take this test and then this polygraph, then this interview. And if I don't pass this and if I don't do that, but then I have to go to training. Oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. How am I ever going to do this? Don't do that. <laughs> do what's in front of you in that moment. What do I have to do at this moment? This moment, I have to fill in this paperwork. That's all I'm going to worry about. And in that moment, I'm going to be so present and focus on that. What's next? Next is this. If you try to look at the overall picture and you look at all the obstacles you have to overcome, you will never do anything. You will kill your dream mm. before you even had a chance for it to exist in your mind. You, and how many times do we do that? We're like, oh, I want to do this amazing thing. And, and we kill it. Well, I can't because of this, because of this, because of this. And I have this quote that I use that I, and I try to surround myself even with people when I work in a business or in the industry if I want to do something. 
And I tell people, I'm like, don't tell me why it can't be done. Tell me how it can be done. I don't want to know all the reasons why it can't be done. That's great. I get it. But how can we do it? I I love it. You've been doing it. We have seven questions, Evie, that we ask every guest that we've had on. And I I can't think of a guest that I've enjoyed spending the time with more than you. So I, I want to first begin by thanking you for your career, for your life, for your passion, for your fire, for living bulletproof. It's an, it's an amazing journey. So question number one of the Live Inspired Seven is, what is the best book you have ever read? Thursday by Madeline Miller. I love that book. It's a, it's a fiction book. It's about Greek mythology, but it's my favorite book. I love the lead character and how she overcomes uh, her obstacles in life. What's the title of the book again? Thursday. I don't know. Thursday. I'm going to find out. All right, perfect. What's the uh, the main character's name? Um, Cersei. She oh, is Cersei. a goddess. Yeah, she's a, she was a goddess. And it's a, she's a Greek mythology goddess. And she told a story of Cersei with fiction in it. But the way she wrote this character, and you, you live all these lifetimes with this character, it just really was inspiring for me. What's one positive characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a child in Queens that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I was going to say fight, but I still, I'm still like a. I a hear fighter. a little like bit I, of fight in you. I'm not sure if I'm missing it. You're just pulling a fast one over on me. I hear a little fight in you still. I think when I was a kid, I think everything was lighter when you're a kid. And so sometimes you lose a little bit of that lightness. What an awesome idea to return to that lightness. It goes back to you you saying, hey, f- focus on what you can control. Stay here in the moment. And I think when we do that, a lot of the lightness returns. Mm-hmm. Evie, if your home caught fire and all living things are out and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what's the one item you would grab? Nothing. Let there's it... nothing I would grab because there's nothing. And I think, no, nothing, John. I mean, there's nothing that I need. Mm. If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who do you want to be seated on that bench right next to? My dad. I'd ask him, like, what's it like where you are? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would want to know. What's it like? What do I got to do? Help me out on this side. I, my dad, which is interesting because I had my dad and I didn't realize, like, there's so many questions now that I have. And despite having him all these years, I realized now after he's gone, you know. There's so many things I didn't get to ask him. But truly, I just want to know what it's like on the other side. I'm like, fill me in. Let me know. But it would be him. That's one question. T- tell me one question, though, on this side of eternity you wish you would have asked him. What's one question before he passed away of pancreatic cancer that you, you just wish you had an opportunity to steal back a few moments and ask again? I know I would tell him that he did a good job. <laughs> and I don't think I told him that enough. That's what I would, I would say this to him. It wouldn't be a question. I would say, dad, I just want you to know, I know you did a good job. Because he was a very, he was a, he was a very gruff man. Like, it wasn't like, I love you and I this, but he had his way. And I think as kids, we look to our parents because we want acknowledgement from them. Yeah. I don't think I gave enough his way. That's what I would do. What's the best advice that Baba, your dad, or anybody else ever gave you? When he was passing, John, and he was at home, the, the hospice nurse was like, he needs to be put into hospice. You can't manage his care anymore. And I got so upset. I, I mean, I'm, my eyes teared up. You know, you're trying to be strong for that person. And he saw my eyes tear up and he came and he hugged me and he said, hey, hey, how are we going to win the battle if you're, if, you're, if you're upset? He's like, how are we going to win this fight if you're upset? Come on. He was kissing me. I remember that. His, that was his advice. He's like, come on. How are we going to win the fight? So how are you going to win the fight if we let it crush us? Mm. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? I think you were an art major at the time. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? Don't worry about it. Everything <laughs> works out. Uh, that's good advice, not only for you to have received, but for yeah. every single one of our listeners to hear loud and clear. So I'll let you say it one more time. Don't worry about it. Stop worrying. Everything always works out. Evie Pemporis, it has been said that all great people, and that is you, my friend, can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? I think it would be kind of like I mentioned earlier, don't tell me why it can't be done. Tell me how it can be done. 
My friends, Evie Pamporis has a book coming out. Uh, is it in April, Evie? April 21st, but it's on pre-order. So anybody can go in and order it even in advance. You also have a television series out. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I'm really excited about this because it's so different than what I've ever done before. Uh, it's called Spy Games, and it will be airing on January 20th on Bravo. And essentially, it's a competition series. And we take contestants and we give them missions on how, you know, how would you become a spy? Could you meet the criteria to be in this world of espionage? And it's myself and I have, uh, there are two other judges. He's former, one of my, my judges, Doug Louth, he's former CIA. The other judge is, Doug, is uh, Errol Southers, he's former FBI. And we have this great competition series and it's about transforming people too through the process. How do you take someone, how do you take the average person and kind of push them to this level of resiliency? And it was not just, you know, who gets disqualified, who makes it through the next mission, but also how does this transform people's lives? And you would see people come in with a lot of fear and how they would eventually let that go. So I'm really excited about it. Well, I can't think of anyone better to teach us about resiliency than the lady I spent the last hour with, Evie Pamporis. I want to thank you for your time and your life, my friends. That is Evie Pamporis. I am John O'Leary, and today is your day. As Evie said, live resiliently, live fearlessly, and live inspired. Before you get on with your day today, I want to celebrate with you an incredible year that 2020 is going to be. I've whispered about it on social media. If you've heard me recently speak at a live speaking event, I've made a few mentions to it there. And I've even shared a little bit of it on a Monday moment back in December. Well, my newest book, In Awe, hits bookshelves in May 2020. As you know, I wrote this book with my four kids in mind. These little ones have so much joy for the day and so much optimism for life. They have inspired me to recapture and harness my childlike senses of wonder in order to become more engaged, more successful, and more fulfilled in life. And in this world of negative news cycles, loneliness as an epidemic, and the chronic struggle of doing more and more and more with less and less and less, my new book, In Awe, will provide you the tools to help rediscover the childlike qualities of wonder, of curiosity, of openness, of belonging, and of freedom that will free you that will permit you to live life more fully, more playfully, and more joyfully. As we dive into this new year, there is no better time than now to pre-order a copy of In Awe. It will remind you of what we once so freely enjoyed and how returning to it will positively transform our communities, our organizations, and our families. So my friends, I want you today to visit me at readinawe.com and pre-order your copy of the book. I believe it's the kind of book that's going to begin a movement reminding us that life is not always easy, but it is good and the best is yet to come. So again, visit me, readinawe.com. My friends, today is your day. Live inspired.